quite unlike my brother's wedding where I had to give the toast and the guy in charge of the affair, they, they played the Johnny, the here's Johnny, and I was expecting that kind of intro. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised people came. I thank you. Um, thanks for taking an interest in this. And uh, I originally, uh, I, when I gave him the title, I uh, changed it to a librarian's perspective. Uh, this is just one person's uh, perspective. I haven't heard anybody else suggest it or take it seriously. So uh, it was with some trepidation that I wanted to uh, present it to more people. But, uh, um, as promised in the description, I wanted to address the question of whether there is an appropriate substitute for the casebook as we know it. And by substitute, I do not mean by using Kindle or any other electronic uh, kind of textbook. I mean substituting the idea of the casebook, that intermediate thing that gets between the students and the law. Um, and so by asking the question, should we use a casebook at all, I'm not at all advocating doing away with the case method. Um, it's not up to me to buck 140 years of legal tradition. Um, and so I, I think there's still value in using the case method. Um, and I also don't think Kelly would be sponsoring the Eline Bell project if the case method were about to die. Um, rather, I'm only asking you to consider using legal research um, to supplement students um, getting the law. Uh, this fits into yesterday's keynote address, uh, where he emphasized uh, active learning and the authenticity of performance and teaching the skills needed in the field. <clears throat> so this, this, this presentation is basically based on two principles. If we don't agree on this, we might as well just go home. The first principle is that legal research is an essential skill that a lawyer needs. I really don't think any of us disagree with that. Um, so that's really not the controversial one. One that we can debate is whether legal research skills sh uh, should be taught in law school. See, the way it is right now, law school legal research instruction basically is a mile wide and a half inch deep. It, it for the most part, provides minimal coverage of basic resources with little long-term retention. Now, this has been my observation in the 10 years I've been around law students. And so, uh, to let you know who I am, I am a librarian at Liberty University uh, Law School. We're uh, four years old. We just graduated our second class of students, so we're new, uh, making things, you know, changing. Uh, the way legal education is done, we have a strong emphasis on uh, lawyering skills. We have six semesters of required lawyering skills classes. They take lawyering skills every semester, and uh, the students take, uh, uh, during the first year, we do legal research, of course, uh, but they also do client interviews, um, they write contracts, and so, you know, and so that is, and so they take this fact pattern they get in their first semester, uh, do a summary judgment motion for their research paper in the spring, and uh, they take depositions in their second and third year and take this all the way to trial and appeal. So uh, we have a very skills-oriented uh, program, and when you're a new program, you can make these things up and not annoy anybody. People came in knowing that's what it is, and you lose elective time, and that's uh, the student's choice. When they come to, they know that. Uh, myself, I am in charge of circulation, and I'm the electronic services librarian. So I know what books are being checked out, and I also have a good idea of how the students are using our electronic resources. And so uh, I tell you this to reveal my bias. I'm one of those cranky librarians who thinks the end of the world's coming because of the decline in research skills. Uh, so the ideas that I'm about to share have been swimming around in my head with, uh, for, for, for the last few years. And uh, every time I discuss these legal research ideas with faculty, the response has always been the same. It's a good idea. But it's never going to work. So, like all misunderstood geniuses, I kept these ideas in my tortured soul and went on. But three events came together and caused a perfect storm uh, where I thought maybe I can share these ideas again. I was inspired. Uh, at the Rip Makes Learn, I just heard about the Ian Langdell. I, I just thought it was a neat idea. I just was inspired when John gave that keynote address. Um, Professor Matthew Bodie's article in the uh, 2007 Journal of Legal Education is called The Future of the Casebook. In that article, he discusses why the casebook, as we now know it, is on its way to extinction. 
And uh, he makes an argument for an open source approach. He didn't have a name for it in 2007, I guess. Much like Eli Dell, an open source approach to uh, where you collaborate and put all your uh, edited materials together and you can share them. And then when I saw that this year's conference was called Transforming Legal Education, I thought, this is it. It's my chance to make another attempt to transform the profession. Um, Casebooks been around for a while. Um, and I said, as I said, I'm not trying to convince you to fully abandon the casebook. Uh, the casebook is tremendously convenient. I recognize that. Um, classroom time is scarce and precious. And uh, the casebook uh, is well designed to keep things on track and uh, present material. And uh, for better or for worse, they do dictate the content and approach to the course materials. So a good casebook um, is, is a good tool. There are plenty of articles discussing the problems with the case method. I'm not here to discuss that, and I'm assuming the case method is going to go on. Um, so what are you doing in a substantive law course? Uh, you're, you're trying to teach students the principles of the law, and then they can apply any facts to that. So you're perform providing the structure and the context, um, and then the students will, through their analysis, be able to, uh, you, you know what the case method is all about. Um, and so, when, when you use a casebook, uh, there are several problems with a casebook. First of all, it's out of date by the time it's printed. New cases uh, come out, statutes uh, change or are amended, and uh, there's a. Can I hang on myself? There's really no incentive to write them. Um, I've read articles saying that they're a whole lot of work without a whole lot of monetary payoff. You know, the famous ones. They make a lot of money, but by and large, you're not well rewarded, um, and it's not seen as original research, and so there's really little incentive to, to write uh, case books. And the students can't use them when they graduate. And uh, when you use a case book, a, there's a cost to you as a professor if you want to deviate from the case book. So uh, you, know, you have to provide the materials, you have to supplement yourself, um, so there, there's a burden on you. Um, so electronic resources can help in the digital age. You can make up your own materials, um, post them, and many people do this. But uh, I had one professor who told me, when I shared this idea with him, he said one semester he thought he would do away with the casebook and he would provide, he said he would never, ever do it again because it was so much work for him. It was just an overwhelming amount of work. And so that, that is the chief burden in creating your own casebook. There's a significant amount of work uh, on the professor's part. step back for a moment to see where we are in legal education. 140 years ago, Christopher Columbus Lindell revolutionized legal education by introducing this case method. And so according to the theory of the case method, the law students would determine the underlying legal principles by analyzing the primary sources, the court opinions. So access to these primary materials was therefore essential, but impractical in Lindell's days, and ironically even today. The library is only open during specified hours, um, there are not enough copies to go around for everybody to read the same thing at the same time. And so because of that limitation, you all know, Langdell wrote a case book. He compiled these original sources himself to save people the trouble of going to the library. So he wanted to provide 24-7 unlimited convenient access to his students, and that's where uh, the case book came from. Well, th these access problems are now resolved. Students do now have 24-7 convenient access to primary materials and secondary materials. Um, the digital library is always open and there are enough copies, therefore, for everybody to, to use. I often wondered if Langdell would have created a casebook if he and his students had access to Lexis and Westlaw. Uh, would there be a need for a casebook if the students had this convenient digital library? I, I don't think so. I, I believe that Langdell and his prodigy probably wouldn't have gone to the trouble if the stuff was available, if these primary sources were available to the students. So, uh, they would have had the students go directly to those primary sources, and uh, they wouldn't need that intermediate casebook. And so, think about to the benefit to you now. If you eliminate the casebook or providing your own materials, um, if you're so inclined to look for an alternative to the casebook, 
Um, if you have students go directly to the sources and do the research themselves. And so you know, it kind of reminds me of you're doing all this work for the students uh, and you're kind of treating them as partners in a law firm where we really should be preparing them to be associates. Um, so anyway, the current casebook supplement model uh, really does encourage students to be, as the McCray report puts it, uh, passive consumers of legal education. And so instead, as McCrate says, students should be encouraged to seek out opportunities to develop this essential lawyering skill. So uh, requiring research in the substantive courses, I think, is one way to include authenticity of performance and to uh, emphasize active learning, as we heard about yesterday. Um, and so when you instruct the students to obtain the cases themselves, it seems trivial, but there is benefit to that. Um, in uh, Professor Lawrence's 2002 article, Casebooks are Toast, um, he says that when students read actual cases, the students confront the raw material of the law, and they learn that after graduation, cases will not come to them, either nicely edited down to eliminate the irrelevant discussion, or with a tidy, square-bracketed synopsis of the facts, as they do in casebooks. And even in my own experience, every September, before we get a chance to teach students, uh, even a chance to show them the library, um, the industrious ones are frustrated with the casebook and they want to, how do I find the case? I want to read the actual case. And so, you know, there's a little bit of a push from the students to, uh, to do this also. Um, so really, I think students, they're going to have to learn the principles of reading cases and statutes um, in practice. Why not start learning it as early as possible? So, every law school uh, every every uh, view book makes a great deal out of the splendor of, of the uh, law library, how nice it is, comfortable and conducive to study. And uh, Thankfully, we do um, get money to keep it nice and comfortable. And uh, there's probably no secret to anybody that uh, we spend a lot of money on our collections to maintain them. Uh, the problem is I don't see enough research being done in my little laboratory. Uh, some argue that the Casebook has made the library irrelevant to the law school experience. Uh, I've seen a lot of students using the library as a study hall, mostly 1Ls, second and third year, you never see them again, for the most part. Um, and indeed, even Langell himself created the casebook for the purpose of making excuse to not go to the library. Uh, I'm also kind of cheap, and so it kind of strikes the, my heart to a uh, have these subscriptions that you pay for, and everybody's library has the only hands that touch the subscription are me when I make sure it's still alive. Or, uh, and I don't even have cable television because I can't stand the thought of I, I'd never leave the house if I had cable television because I've been paying for it. So, now my, my frugality is not the reason we should change the way we teach, but uh, there, there are better reasons to do that. The two reasons we should consider integrating research into the substantive classes um, is one, because of the current state of legal research instruction. And second, our concern for preparing our students for their uh, place in the, in the profession. You're probably sick of librarians who whine about the decline of research skills. <laughs> we complain about the inadequate amount of time carved out for legal research instructions, and that's all well documented, there are plenty of articles about that. But really, the fact does remain that law students are sent into the world with inadequate research skills. And uh, law firms are performing the training where law schools aren't. And I don't think it's a fault of the students. I really don't. A few years ago, I came to this understanding, and I had more compassion for it, because there's a lot to do in your first year. And we're throwing research on, and it's not attached to anything else. And so it, it's very possible that we're teaching, Bob Baring at a Berkeley says, we're teaching the wrong people, the wrong materials, at the wrong time. Um, and so, you know, this might not bother academics. After all, why not save those research skills until they really need it? I really don't think that you really learn something until you have to learn it. And so uh, for that reason, I suggested that we take legal research out of our first semester and put it in the second. And uh, the results so far, it's only been one semester, but they say that the, uh, the briefs were actually better, the research was better as a result. So the theory was 
you know, I, I was taking it, learning the right, the timing was different. So as they were learning their fact pattern and having their research, that, that's when we were providing the legal research instruction. Hopefully they'll remember a little better based on the emails I'm getting uh, over the summer. I told them to, uh, still, it's, it might be the wrong time. Um, So, yeah, the other problem with research is that it's not linked to their substantive courses, the ones that are deemed more important. Um, it's usually for less credit, and honestly, it's taught by librarians and adjuncts, and so all these things together just diminish the importance of it in the students' minds, and they just don't have the time, so they say, uh, to learn it. That's a different issue. But, uh, um, Preparation for the profession. I personally believe that law firm, law schools have an obligation to uh, instill good legal research skills. It might be in my own self-interest as a librarian, but think about it. If you need a benefactor for a capital improvement project, should the benefactors be pleased with the students that you're sending them? Your students can't even, if your students can't even perform Basic legal research, a task they'll spend approximately 45% of their time doing as new associates. Um, is your school going to be seen as a good investment? Um, so most, most law schools, this isn't news, do recognize the gaping hole in legal research, and it's, it's uh, addressed by having an advanced legal research class, which is better, um, and there's a lot more learning going on. But it turns out it's still an elective that's generally not required. Uh, it reaches only a small percentage of students, generally, because it's an elective. And uh, it's still isolated from the substantive courses. I went to a program yesterday where uh, he was talking about the practice. You know, the repetitive nature um, is what helps reinstill and becomes a habit. And uh, I think that's what we should be doing with research. So, what might it actually look like? Um, during the first year, that's probably the best time to keep a casebook. Um, but still, uh, during the first year, your object is to help students learn how to read cases and statutes and to develop critical analysis skills. So um, even something that's as seemingly trivial as sending students to find their own cases, there is good value in that. And there are other lessons you can teach them uh, that can be taught. For example, doing a search to find a citation, it costs $8 in the real world. The same cost in all in the same search in all cases uh, is 170 some dollars. So it's not a trivial thing. Something as simple as retrieving a case by citation. Um, so there are those lessons that could be learned. Um, so instead of editing and reproducing uh, cases, have the students develop that skill. Have them read the real cases like they would in the real world. And instead of the statutory supplements. You know, you'll save them some money, and they'll be reading the actual statute as it is today, and uh, learning some valuable research skills, and then you know the annotations to help interpret it. Um, I, I just think it's important for the students to gain a basic familiarity with the systems, and they're just not getting that with the busy work that we give them in, in legal research instruction. And uh, you know, the, the world isn't limited, of course, to Westlaw and Lexis. There are other um, services, free services um, that uh, students really should know about but never use because uh, they don't have to. So that's what I'm saying is can we build in to the substantive courses opportunities for, so you don't have to replace the casebook altogether, but provide opportunities for students to do research. Now the second and third year are the best time. According to Bob Baring, genuine instruction in legal research can be accomplished only in the second and third year of law school. He says, uh, second year students are the best candidates for learning legal research. They have the necessary grasp of legal jargon and a basic understanding of a few substantive areas of law. So they are ripe for being taught because they're aware of what they don't know. And they're often angry because their first year of research class left them unprepared and misinformed. Like I'm saying, I don't think it's a fault of the class or a fault of the students. It's just the wrong time. So the second year substantive courses is where you can really take off and uh, instill legal research skills. This, of course, requires reorientation of how you present the class, um, and how you present the materials in your class. Really, there's, there's no limit to what you can do. Um, 
You can start out, for example, with the case that you need them to read. And from there, you just have them go through the legal research process. And as they practice it in all their substantive courses, it becomes habit and ingrained, and they'll be good legal researchers. That's really the, the heart of what I'm trying to say. Um, so then we start with the secondary, also read articles, uh, using Shepard's and key sites, expand your research, see the development of the law. It, it just seems that there's a whole, and I understand class time is precious, and it does impose a burden on the students, but I think the burden is worth that. I really don't think it's busy work to have the students engaging in legal research to prepare for their class. So you give them a topic and have them, towards the end, do all the research on that topic, and that's their class preparation, and your class is used to discuss. So, uh, and again, these are all materials that are available through our subscriptions. Um, Three statements, encyclopedias, um, all are available on Westlaw. For librarians, you all know that in case there are professors here. All those things are available. Uh, Professor Bodie um, brings up a couple of, of uh, points uh, to consider towards the end of his article. Um, one is about uh, his concern over posting copyrighted material. Um, he alerts us to the potential problems. If you're posting copyrighted material, that's a bad thing. And uh, my response to that is to say that sending the students to the database to obtain it vaporizes that concern. You know, there's no copyright issue. It's an educational purpose. Um, and so don't worry about posting it. You save yourself some work. And it seems trivial, but a lot of what associates do is busy and trivial. It's an important skill for them to learn. Um, again, we're preparing to be associates, not partners. Um, he also expresses legitimate concerns over long-term access to posted materials. Um, he writes, admittedly, an online casebook would be easier to create under the aegis of West Westlaw or Lexis, and users would have access to electronic versions of the cases and statutes and regulations um, and even media sources, but there would be, um, there'd be no need to seek out independent copyright waivers, but we as professors would then be locked into using these sources and systems. They may continue to allow us free access, but they will in all likelihood eventually charge the students. We would be doing all the work, writing the articles, editing the cases, and compiling the materials, and we would not be able to ensure continued access to it. And that's the reason we have something like eLangdell, um, more likely. And I'm not going to address exactly what he's talking about with access to your materials. Again, I think this is vaporized when you have the students accessing it themselves. I think there's a good reason to do it pedagogically. And uh, they're, they're not, your own materials, that, that is a problem. Um, being locked into their systems. I'm thinking in terms of, of uh, research right now. Being locked into the system is, is, is really part of life. Um, if you have an iPhone, then you're locked into AT&T. There, there's really, well, I guess there are technical ways around it, but th this is what <laughs> life is about. And so I think by having students do the legal research going directly to the sources, they're becoming familiar with them and knowing what the options are. They're not going to be using their casebook later on in life. Why not have them engaging in the tools? And even if the tools change, I think there's a good chance. I mean, what's more, he's talking about continued access to legal to uh, materials. What's more likely, your edited copy on Elaine Dell or the copy owned by the publisher? You know, there's a lot of concern when West took over the uh, American Law Reports, the ALRs. Um, they took it over so they could abandon it. Well, it's actually stronger than ever. And in fact, it's, it's better than ever because of the results plus. And so the ALR is promoted in a whole new way, and students actually are understanding why they're so important because of, of that change. So the ALRs didn't go away. There's good value in it, and that's why it's continued. So for continued access to the resources, I, I, I know you're not supposed to trust the uh, publishers, but I trust that somebody's going to um, continue access to, the, to these materials if they're important enough. And you know, whatever's out there, that's what they're going to be using in practice. So even if it changes um, publisher, at least uh, they're familiar with the resource. Um, so um, hopefully we'll all prevail. 
uh, in, in whatever format uh, we teach our classes. Um, I have a list of the sources consulted that's posted on the website, um, just for your information and edification. Um, really, this came about because I know that students aren't using uh, a lot of the resources enough. So I, I would strongly encourage, in any way you can, to get your students in. We, like I said, are a small law school. We're new, um, and our CCH rep called me in the spring and said, by golly, and her, her territory is North Carolina and goes up to Charlottesville. Charlottesville, who's there? Well, our little law school had the highest CCH use of anybody in her territory last year, because I encouraged the business professors to do just this. They have a read of, um, treatise um, on, on, a, on CCH business. And so yeah, people are using it, and I think this is good for the students and the profession. And uh, the people at CCH are actually thrilled because there are people using it before they enter practice. Um, so really, that, that moment might have been the inspiration for uh, my, my sharing this with you. Um, I'd like to open it up for discussion. And you can tell me, because I've thought this for a long time. I've heard it a lot anyway. It's a stupid idea. Nobody's going to. Um, what do you think? Yes, sir. I appreciate the need for students to learn legal research at the right time. Um, I was sorry to hear from your professor who said that he tried to do it all himself once and abandoned the idea because it was too much work because I'm about to do that myself in, con in Constitutional Law 1 because the casebook I was using has become not usable. <clears throat> One of the things that I need to do though is have my students have access to edited cases. I don't want them I mean, I will have them reading some full text cases, opinions, dissents, and so forth, but, but your model seems to have them doing that for everything throughout the entire course. If the, if the whole course in, it, it involves doing legal research to find the appropriate cases and reading and talking about it, um, they're reading everything in the original, nothing edited. And not just the, and it's not really a model, it's a proposal to generate discussion. This has never been implemented anywhere. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll bless <laughs> it with the, with, as a model. <laughs> but uh, uh, when I say everything, it, it's just like legal research. You start with your issue. You know exactly what you want to cover in that class, is how I envision it. And so you know that narrow issue. And so you look up the encyclopedia, and you get a basic idea. That leads you to some leading cases. Um, and, and so it's following the legal research process. It, it's true, it might not work. It might be too much work to do it all that way. But for, for limited things, I, I think introducing the legal research process into, in, in addition to whatever supplemental materials you have um, is, is all I'm really suggesting, uh, realistically. Yes? I, you may have just addressed two things that came to mind for me, that, uh, but I'll throw them out there. Um, if, if you have students kind of deciding what is appropriate for a class discussion, saying go research this point, then you would have them at different starting points, which can be very productive. But if the point of the class is really uh, we need to be thinking about the same issues and debating them, different starting points would, could be seen as a negative. Right. Yeah, but, but the other one, the other point is is really about my prediction, which could go uh, awry, of student behavior, which is that they would begin as kind of flocks do. They would figure out ways to rationalize their work, and they'd end up creating ad hoc case books mm -hmm. based on uh, the fact that they don't want to all be researching this. They don't want to all be printing out. They just assign different things, people do one week, and then they're just putting it together and, and replicating uh, at, at great expense of time the effort to put it together one case book. In some sense, they are doing it already when you have, um, there are sub, the, the sound of substance, the understanding here, you know, they are supplementing their studies already. They have those little flashcards, they have those outlines on one sheet, which are remarkable um, from, from an Oscar point of view, not a, a a good thing kind of point of view, but uh, yeah, probably some structure um, should be imposed, assigning a <coughs> criminal case um, and as, as a starting point. 
Right. You, you, you don't want utter chaos, of course. Um, or, uh, you know, selecting a leading treatise that's available online as, as the assigned reading. Assignments from the restatements. I'm just saying, we have these things. Why not direct people to them and use them more? So it could be more directed, but it might not that be. It might not be that grand a proposal, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> but it's not being done. And anything that we can do to so really the integration of the research at the right time into the substantive classes when people are paying attention, they're doing the work for the substantive classes, not for legal research. And you got your business um, professors to start doing a little bit of it in CCH. Did you help them put that together? Or suggest no. that you could? I mean, most of our professors are, are practitioners and they came in, and so uh, they, they were familiar already with it. it also, one thing I forget to say, you know, any other, most other graduate programs, you know, research is essential. Teaching yourself is essential to learning your discipline. And so, you know, law is a little different from other disciplines, I understand, but, uh, you know, I think the research aspect, since we call it a terminal degree, should, should, should carry greater emphasis. You may have addressed this at the, at the very beginning of your uh, presentation, but do, do students come to you and uh, show you citations in their case book and ask, you know, uh, how do I find this cita citation to the restatement or this old English case that might have been cited in a, in a contracts book, how do, I, how do I look this up? Is that, was that the main impetus, impetus for this? Um, I think mostly they just wanted to read the case, the unedited version the unedited of the case from their case book. They were but, those, curious. but those ancillary uh, citations, have they been asking you for those as well? Or? Not as much. Some of them are incorporated in, in the subject class, in the first year classes. They do towards and contracts especially. In fact, one contract professor actually had them purchase, to my horror, um, the restatement of contracts. The whole thing? Yeah. Um, a student version, but still, it was quite expensive. Particularly when they already had access to it, at least three ways. So. How would you get other props in your, your school to do something like your business ones are? I mean, as, there's several of us in here that are librarians who may or may not teach legal research. Do you have suggestions on ways that we could help our faculty towards at least minimally some of your ideas? I don't. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really don't. You know, I, I, I suggest it, and some people, like I said, most response is usually it, it can't happen. But uh, I would never teach without a case for which is fine. Which is fine. You know. Why I'm asking is, is I've done this with some of my tax professors to get the, is to provide a couple of fairly directed scenarios where there's like one or two general counsel memorandums that cover the answer or something like that that I've provided them. And they're actually much more willing to do that. And when they know what the answer should be, and it's just kind of getting them in. I haven't been able to broaden it past tax yet. Mm -hmm. I, I can foresee faculty being receptive to, so I, I am faculty member, I, I can foresee people like me being somewhat receptive to this where you are addressing in class a subject that is comparatively discreet, um, such that if I told my students there are three Supreme Court cases on fair use and copyright, that's all there ever been in, in history. Go find them and read, you know, Roman numeral three of the majority opinion in the most recent one, and maybe I can limit the prospect that way. But if I can describe to them a universe of information that is comparatively finite and, and bounded, uh, and then turn them loose in the library to, to find that, maybe that's the way to do it. I, there, there are, I, in several of the classes I teach, and I'm sure more broadly, Units within each class that that involve materials that are that are relatively easy to describe the boundaries. Now I could never say to them, 
go read every case decided by any court on fair use in the last you know ten years or something like that because that would consume the entire semester. But for at least some kinds of introductory material, there 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 exist ways to describe things where I think your method would work. Yeah, you, you certainly have to limit it to jurisdiction. Um, yeah, any way you can limit it, but at least you know again the goal is to provide the structure of the law. And so obtaining it through. Um, edited cases are also available through the uh, one of the vendors out there was called video, uh, court video, whatever they're called. I uh, just looked at their brochure. Um, they have all the many, many trial uh, links, um, but they also have edited versions of, of lots and lots of cases. So that's another alternative if, if uh, your school have to subscribe to that. Uh, one source of edited cases. I guess it's Friday, it's Miller time, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right then.